book of Acts, back to the book of Acts. We took a couple of weeks off of the book of Acts. But today we're going to be looking at um, a meanwhile, because we've been looking at chapter uh, 8, and we had uh, uh, Philip, and uh, then we got the, the, the Samaritans, and the early part of chapter 9 was about Paul. And now here we are at the, uh, at the end of chapter 9, and we have the setup for chapter 10. And chapter 10 is uh, one of my favorite chapters. It's uh, long, but we'll abbreviate it when we get to it. And, and this is, uh, so meanwhile, back to Peter. Back to Peter. And a big event takes place in Acts chapter 10, and it begins to unfold in the city of Joppa, which is where we're going to land today. These 12 verses, from 32 to 43, explain how Peter happened to be in Joppa at the beginning of Acts chapter 10. Now, before I get started here, let me just tell you that whenever we get into a passage like this, uh, there's, there's a huge elephant in the room that perhaps nobody notices but me, but I'm always very conscious about, uh, about this, um, this, this elephant. Smell it? And, and what we have here in this chapter is we have a healing and a raising from the dead. And so immediately people look around and say, do we do that? It'd be nice. I absolutely positively believe, and I'll go into more detail in a few moments, that God heals miraculously today. But there is a prosperity living doctrine that I just can't subscribe to. I tried for years to subscribe to the prosperity living doctrine. And the prosperity living doctrine says that God wants you to be healthy and wealthy and Satan wants you to be sick and poor. And all health and wealth comes from God. I can acknowledge that. And all sickness and poverty comes from Satan. Yeah, no. So the reality is that when you are in a movement or a church that preaches the God heals everybody every time except for your lack of faith. If you've got the faith, and, and true, Jesus said, if you've got the faith, you can move mountains. But you know what's always been my problem? Having the faith to move a mountain. Uh, I, uh, when I was seven years old, I, 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 I prayed for superpowers. I tried to move things, but none of that worked out for me. But nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, when I was uh, a teenager, uh, about 15, uh, the uh, family across the street that had the restaurant across the street, they were, by our standards, wealthy. And um, uh, they came to our church, and our church was an old, dry, really, really, really dry Southern Baptist church where, where at this point in time, now we'd had a fire evangelistic preacher that preached the gospel, but at this point in time, we had a, a Ph.D. from a uh, seminary, uh, the one in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, his messages were just dry. And sometimes we had a service one time where my dad fumed out and said he didn't even mention Jesus Christ the whole time in the message. And that's true, he didn't. And, and so uh, nonetheless, the, uh, this Italian man uh, that owned the restaurant across the street brought us family in and they sat across there were uh, some of them had were grown and married but there were uh, one two three four five that were present every Sunday at church they sat on the second row which is kind of where the youth used to sit but okay they came in and displaced us before we got in there and then that was their seat from then on and uh, twice exactly twice timed about 10 minutes apart in the message he would say amen well, we just weren't that kind of a church, you know? And we're thinking, what's he excited about? And then I would, uh, it got to be kind of a game with us young people. When's he going to do it? And the preacher would say something that was 
only moderately not as dull as some of the other stuff that he said. And we'd say, this is going to be it. <laughs> and uh, almost never got that right because I, I don't know. I, it could have been the amens were just when he woke up. I don't know. But, but anyway, they started having prayer meetings in their home on Thursday nights. And uh, so uh, some of us young people started going to it, and it was a prayer meeting and a Bible study. Well, not exactly a Bible study. All they studied was the book of Acts, just Acts, and which was one more book of the Bible than we actually studied otherwise. And so to us, it seemed like a Bible study. And, and there's a lot of things that go on in the book of Acts. Acts 2 is packed with excitement. And Acts 8 and Acts 10, and, and this chapter right here, when you get a, a, a sick, a, a lame person healed and a dead person raised, you're going, whoa, that's pretty good. And so it was taught that if they did it back then, we do it now. As a matter of fact, they took a verse out of context. Uh, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he did it yesterday... He can do it today and he can do it forever. Well, sure he can. But what wasn't explained to us at the time is what are those circumstances and what is God's paradigm for determining when he does what? Now, I, I used to, uh, for, uh, I only got cured of this about 15 years ago, where I had a really, really integrated and detailed systematic theology that I followed. Yep, God does this. Nope, God never does this. God never does this. God never does this. Now, now the witch of Endor didn't fit too good anywhere. The donkey talking, that didn't fit too good anywhere. As a matter of fact, Balaam the prophet, who was a false prophet, but happened to authentically get a word from God, that didn't fit anywhere. So there were lots of things that didn't fit, but you just don't talk about those things. But then when you start preaching through the Bible, as I've selected to do, when I get to chapter 9, I thought, well, you know what, to avoid confusion, I could just skip it. <laughs> could skip these verses right here, 32 to 43. But no, that's not fair, because I think that if we don't do anything else, even when I'm at my dullest, I think that it's important that I level with you and just say, here's what I know and here's what I don't know. I want when you leave a message that I've preached that you say, I learned something today. And so today I hope you learned something. Now let's go back to the thing of the healing. When Jesus, in chapter John, uh, John chapter 5, when Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda, there were all of these sick people around the pool. And there was the lame man on his bed and said, you know, the angel come and stirs the water and the first one in gets, gets healed and the rest everybody's tough luck. And he said, I got nobody to lower me in the water when the angel comes, but I'm staying here anyway because may as well be around all these sick people. At least I feel kind of lucky sometimes. I don't, he probably didn't say that. But. <laughs> but anyway, so Jesus tells that one man, take up your bed and walk. Man been lame all his life. Jesus healed the one man. And they walked out, showed himself off, and but right in front of Jesus were all of those other people around the pool whom he didn't heal. Well, what about that? Now I know uh, I know when when uh, when you go through and you're uh, Running for president, you list all of your accomplishments and none of your failures. I get that. And, and so I wouldn't expect John to go through and list all of the failures of Jesus Christ. But they weren't failures of Jesus. They were failures of the people to whom he was ministering. But uh, one, for instance, remember Jesus heals the, uh, the, the man that's been blind from birth. And then he says, I see men as trees walking around. And so then there was part two. And then he saw perfectly. But it says in uh, Mark chapter 6 verse 5 that when Jesus went to his own hometown of Nazareth, he didn't do many miracles there, and he was astounded at the 
unbelief, the disbelief of the people in Nazareth, and that is the reason it is said, because of, of widespread unbelief, he wasn't able to do all the miracles that he was accustomed to doing there. So the, the audience sometimes limits what God not can do, but what God will do. And so the fact is this, no matter what anybody tells you, the doctrine that God will heal everybody every time if you have the faith, not a correct doctrine. Now, God does miraculously heal, and we've got, we've got uh, instances in our church of where God miraculously healed when there was no other way as far as the doctors were concerned. But look, that's not everybody every time. And it's frustrating, and that becomes the elephant in the room. When you go to a church that preaches God heals everybody every time, and you've got just as many people that are out that day because of colds. You've got that, just as many people wearing glasses. You've got just as many people wearing hearing aids. You've got, and you're going, what's the deal here? Somebody help me understand what's going on here. I mean, does God heal everybody every time he's got the faith? All of these people are faithless. Let's kick them out of the church then. Let's get faithful people in the church. <laughs> now, um, I um, had a conversation one time with... Uh, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Now, it came to pass, as Peter went through all the parts of the country, they also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. There he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. Now, first I want to bring your attention to the word saints right there, because... Uh, uh, a lot of people get confused. The Catholics have kind of confused us on what that word saint means. Um, the, uh, throw out some, uh, some Greek at you. Cause I don't try to use it unless it's pertinent. And it's pertinent here. Okay, Hagias is the Greek word for holy. And holy is actually an adjective. Um, but sometimes we use adjectives as nouns, right? Because sometimes... Uh, if you're throwing a fancy party, yeah, you're just inviting the rich. Well, rich is an adjective, right? It, but we understand you're talking about rich, not pigs, not dogs. You're talking about rich people, and it's understood. So sometimes we use adjectives in the place of nouns. Well, that's the case here with the word saints. Hagias is the word that precedes pneuma, meaning Holy Spirit. What kind of spirit? Because pneuma means just wind. So what's the difference between just plain old wind and holy wind? The holy wind, the Holy Spirit, is what indwells a believer when he gets saved. The Holy Spirit is what makes a difference in the victorious life of a Christian. And so this Holy Spirit, this hagias, the word for sanctification is hagiasmas makes a noun out of this adjective. And the way you holy somebody up is hagiadzo. All of them have the same root, which hagiadzo is translated, I sanctify. All right, sanctify means to set apart, to set it apart. So if someone is set apart, they are set apart to what? Well, I'm set apart to go to heaven when I die. I'm set apart because I set myself apart and says I want to live for Jesus. Sanctified means to be set apart for a purpose. In our case, our purpose is all about God and our, our, uh, the way we hold and revere God and the way we're set apart when we die to go to heaven. All right, now, that's what hagiadzo is. That's sanctify. And once you are sanctified, you are sanctified because... You trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You were at that point indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and when you were indwelled by the Holy Spirit, you became hagias. You became holy. Now, a lot of times people are timid about saying, yeah, I'm holy, uh, because immediately people begin to think, well, yeah, but I saw you do such and such. That, if you're holy, I'm a stick in the mud. Uh, just made that up. I don't. That, that's not even a good one. But 
Uh, yeah, yeah, right, you're holy. Well, I am holy because I was sanctified the day that I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I was indwelt by the Holy Spirit, Hagios, and therefore I was Hagiazod, sanctified, and now sanctification is just part of my being. So yes, I am righteous before God. Now, how do I get righteous before God? Because a lot of people get really, really confused. No matter how much we preach grace, there are churches that are still confusing their people about the way you live your life, the way you act, the way you smell, the way you talk. But here's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.30. Paul's writing to the church of Corinth, who was some really disgusting people, by the way. The most troubled church from the letters written by Paul, the most troubled church in the New Testament, Church of Corinth. Widespread sin, overt sin right there in the church. And he writes uh, this, this steaming letter to them in 1 Corinthians and then 2 Corinthians says, you know, I'm sorry about what I told you before, but you deserved it. And so 1 Corinthians, he says, but of him are you guys, you folks at the church of Corinth, are in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. How do we get that? We were made that way. God made us that way when we trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Paul writes to them again. He says, he says, For he, God, has made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be, important word, made the righteousness of God in him. We are made righteous, and that's why we are saints. We are holy, because we've been made righteous. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So all who dwelt at Lydda and, Sh and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Now, this is not Peter's first rodeo. I mean, he's done this before. As a matter of fact, in um, uh, Acts chapter 3, he's uh, outside the gate called Beautiful, and there's the man that's been lame from birth. And uh, Jesus says, Silver and gold, and Peter says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he does. And so Peter, he's got expectations here. You know, I, I can do a lame man. I've done a lame man before. I've been here, I've seen it. I got faith, I got confidence, I want to pray for this lame man. And uh, so he, he tells him, make up your bed and come on, and he rose immediately. And the people going around say, whoa. Now this is, uh, I'll show you a little map here. See the, um, Sharon is a region. And if you see in red there on the Mediterranean Sea is Joppa. And then if you come over to the west, uh, or to the east rather, uh, southeast, there's Lydda. Now, by the way, today Joppa is called Jaffa, and Lydda is called Lod, and where actually the actual city location of uh, Lydda was is an airport, Ben Gurion Airport. So uh, they didn't have airports back then, but later on it became that. As a matter of fact, the ancient city of Lydda is probably right there underneath the runway somewhere. So uh, the uh, distances there, uh, straight line distances, of course, they have to travel roads. You can see uh, Jerusalem uh, east, southeast there uh, in blue letters. It's about 35 miles straight line to Jerusalem. From Joppa to Lydda, it's about 12 miles. Uh, 12 miles by road, 12 miles. So um, kind of close. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha which is translated Dorcas, this woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. This is going to be harder. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Now, by the way, her Aramaic name was Tabitha. Uh, it means gazelle, and so they picked the Greek name, which means gazelle and it happened to be Dorca. 
So you wonder, why doesn't Tabitha sound anything like Dorca? Well, because they both are the word for gazelle. It's kind of like with Peter. I mean, when Jesus met Peter, uh, his name was Simon. He was named after the Simeon of the Old Testament, Simon. And uh, Jesus then renamed Simon Cephas, which is Aramaic for rock. Why did he name him rock? And then his Greek name, the Greek word for rock is Petros, well Petra, neuter, turned into a name, masculine, Petros. So that's the way they did names back then. If your name didn't mean anything, then they just transliterated your name. But if your name meant something, then they just picked a word that meant that and you know went on. Now, uh, we got somebody that died here. So the question arises, well, was, she, was she really dead? Well, now, everybody pretty much agrees that Luke, who wrote Acts, was a doctor, and Luke probably knew dead. I mean, he probably had a pretty good idea. Yeah, I'm going with she's dead. And um, uh, Jesus had healed, uh, had brought back to life uh, the daughter of Jairus, the uh, Jairus, the um, uh, head of the synagogue. Uh, this is a new experience for Peter, though. He's never raised anybody from the dead. I mean, um, but it's interesting because ordinarily back then, if someone died, the Egyptians embalmed important people, but everybody else, because of the climate and the heat, and you actually, you know. Uh, wrapped them up, and buried them the same day. Well, she dies. Are they So, let me. I might disappoint you. She is dead. They all agree she's dead. What do they say? They say, let's go get Peter. Now, notice uh, that Peter is in uh, at least three hours each way. Take, you know, you be probably had a good idea that he was staying with Simon the Tanner because word got out through that whole region, Sharon all the way up to Caesarea probably. All, everybody knew uh, Peter was a big man. Everybody knew where he was probably. But still they had to go over there, three hours over there, it's 12 miles, uh, uh, get Peter three hours. It had to take at least seven, maybe ten hours. So they're talking about sending somebody on a, on a it'd be ten hours before they get back. Not only is she really washed her up before, she has been dead most of the day. So what are they expecting? Since Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. How must that conversation have gone? When they came up and found Peter there at Time of the Tanner's house. Um, uh, uh, Peter, we got this situation, and, uh, you know, Peter just healed a lame man, eight years lame. We got this situation, uh, she's sick. Uh, not anymore. No, she's, she's actually dead. I mean, no. Peter, what? So, always went with them. Brought her all and weeping, showing the tunics and garments Doris had made while was with them. I kind of music that they took the time. Oh, okay, I'm going to do a face and face. This is why we love her. She gives us free stuff. And and she's gone, and we, we, we just need you to help us a little bit right here. Uh, so, so he uh, he goes up to the uh, 
to, to the upper room. I mean, is Peter expected to keep everybody from dying? I mean, I think about it. Uh, I had a discussion with um, someone dear to me uh, 40 years ago. And the discussion was over this very issue of sickness and death. And I said, I said, well, then if they don't get sick and die, So uh, think about it for just a moment. Peter obviously prays and she's healed. And I hate to, hate to give away the ending, but you get it. Is everybody living now at this point? And how do we decide who lives and who dies? As a matter of fact, if it were the case that everybody who has the faith can be healed every time from their sickness, why don't we have people who are two and three and four hundred years old with us today? I mean, not just look like they're that old. I mean, I actually have people that are that old. Why don't, why don't we have that? Well, at some point in time, it is time to go. Now, God heals, miraculously heals people, the scripture tells us that he does. And as a matter of fact, we are commanded in James chapter 5 to pray for the sick. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, it says. So we're told by James that yes, we should pray for the sick, and yes, we should pray for the healing. But this, I mean, she's dead. And so back to it for just a moment. The doctrine that Jesus is the author of health and wealth and Satan is the author of sickness and poverty is not a legitimate doctrine. I, I, I read a message the other day. I didn't hear it preached. I read a message the other day where one of the prosperity-giving preachers was making the case that Jesus didn't travel by foot, that he traveled in luxury, that he was a rich man, that he, you know, and I'm going, what? Jesus could have floated anywhere he wanted to go, but he chose to walk. So Peter put them all out, knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. I wonder what that prayer sounded like. And you know, I just wonder things like this. Inquiring minds want to know, when they close the door and there's Peter with the dead body, I've heard people pray loud and rebuke Satan and, and rebuke the demons and, and, and scream and... I've heard that. I've been in the presence of that before. I was, uh, uh, when I was uh, 17 years old, I went with a friend of mine, uh, and she and I went together to a camp meeting in Lexington. It was like an old-fashioned camp meeting. Sawdust on the floor and, and uh, uh, open air on the sides and uh, benches to sit on and at the end, they had the, uh, the evangelist, uh, he had a healing and a prophecy line, no, the same line. And uh, it, was, it, was, it, had, it had dozens of people in the line going up to, to, uh, to talk to him. And uh, uh, you would hear him praying, and it was, he was screaming and rebuking Satan and because he subscribed to the doctrine that everybody gets healed if they have the faith, and you've got to get Satan out of the picture, and you've got to rebuke Satan. Now, uh, my friend uh, that I went with, she had like 2,300 vision, more glasses, 
couldn't see anything without glasses. And um, so she went down to get her eyes healed. And um, I mean, I was I was I was a believer in all this. I, I I wasn't there wasn't a cynical bone in my body when I went to this. And so she went down. She waited in line, and I waited. I mean, we waited until they shut the doors. We were we were just there. We driven from Lexington, and we weren't going home until all the action was over. And uh, she uh, came back, and I said, "So what happened?" She said. I got my vision back. I went, wow. I mean, I, we, we, we drove all the way back and she was praising the Lord and thanking God for you know, getting her vision back. And um, Let me tell you something. Something, inside information that you may not know unless you've been in that environment. There is, there is this doctrine that is taught that you won't get the full blessing unless you claim it immediately as having already been done. Yes. And so the healing will not continue unless you claim the healing. And so when someone says, were you healed, you must say, praise God, yes I was. And so uh, a couple weeks went by and uh, she wore no glasses. And her mama came to her one day and says, Honey, I mean, you're a straight-A student. What's wrong? She says, Mama, I can't see. And she was trying to claim it. She couldn't see. Oh, when I got to school the next uh, day and some of, my, uh, some of my Pentecostal friends, I heard you went to that, that camp meeting in Lexington. I said, Yeah, we were there. It was, just, it was, it was a cool. Oh, yeah, it was cool. I said, must have been really something when they raised that guy from the dead. I said, uh, I said, you know, I'm not saying that's not possible, but I'm saying I stayed till they shut the door. Well, there were no doors, but I'm, I stayed till they turned out the lights, and yeah, nobody got raised from the dead. Now, isn't it interesting how that just a couple of days later, they're talking about something that happened at the camp meeting that didn't actually happen. Well, I, I uh, sometimes I call it uh, cynical. Um, cynical is, is, is such a negative word. <laughs> yeah, I guess, isn't it? I'm sure if you look in the dictionary, that's yeah, negative. All right? Um, but don't you find that the older we get, the more cynical we get about things that can and cannot happen? You know, when, when, uh, when someone then comes to us, the, the phone calls we get, you've been and selected, and then you're going, yeah, no, I don't think so. Uh, we've, we've adopted the things that are too good to be true. And, and let me tell you something. Sometimes, not very often, Sometimes we miss out on a blessing. Sometimes. But so often, more than not, it's too good to be true. It's just somebody trying to heist you. You know, I uh, 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 played along with a guy uh, last Saturday uh, who, who uh, hijacked somebody's account and... Uh, Jim Harbert, some of you probably know Jim Harbert. Jim Harbert, yeah. He came across as Jim Harbert. And, uh, and I knew I was friends with him already. So I was a friend, sure. And uh, so uh, just it wasn't 45 seconds to come across, hello. I don't do Messenger, by the way. If you try to get to me on Messenger, I don't do Messenger on Facebook. But this one, I was waiting on it, so I did. So he said, Hello. And I said, hey, great to hear from you. I thought you were upset with me. <laughs> he said, uh, uh, no, 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 I'm good. I said, did your daughter recover from... And he said, y yeah, she's fine. And uh, have you heard about the program? I said, program? No, what program? And then, so we, you know, back and forth and... I, I got a hundred thousand dollars of this program. I didn't know he's going back and forth, and and uh, I'm having a good time. I'm leading him on. I'm wasting his time, 
and uh, and I'm getting preaching material. I didn't get as much preaching material as I wanted, but uh, I was hoping to get something truly outrageous. But then everyone goes, "What are you doing in there?" So I said, oh, "Okay, all right." Trying to get us a hundred thousand dollars. Leave me alone. So, uh, and that was two Saturdays in a row. The week before that, it was the uh, wife of the pastor I served back in North Carolina. Uh, but it, things that seem too good to be true are too good to be true. Most of the time. But not always. And so it's unfortunate that life has caused us to become somewhat cynical. So, you know, he took her hand, lifted her up, and Peter had to be thinking, well, look what I did. I mean, whoa, I, re- I saw Jesus do it, but now, look. I'm sure he's given all the glory to God. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord, so it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a tanner. Now, by the way, that's where Cornelius sends to, in chapter 10, to that house, Simon the tanner, to get Peter to get him to go with him, uh, with the, the, the uh, servants to bring Peter back and uh, preach to them. Now, the miracle resulted in evangelization. And, and that's the key. So there is this doctrine that you're not going to remember, and I'm going to spend like two minutes on it, and then we're done. Cessationism. And it's like a theological term. And cessationism is the doctrine that when the church age, the church, early church age was over, when the apostles were all dead, that God ceased to to miracles and healing and and other spiritual gifts. Well, uh, then there's uh, absolute cessationism and and classic uh, cessationism. It's, 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 It's a really interesting, multifaceted doctrine. But basically, the classical cessation, which I didn't think I belonged in that crowd at all until I read more accurately and realized that my belief is this. And I guess I can sum up my systematic theology like this. Don't put God in a box. Because when you say God can't do something, you're going to find out that yeah, he can and uh, so, so when it comes to uh, people ask me, do you believe in prophets? I said, well, yeah, there were prophets. And there were prophets in the Old Testament, there were prophets in the New Testament. The, uh, the men who wrote the New Testament, they were prophets. There were other prophets. There will be prophets in, uh, uh, in the tribulation and, the, uh, and afterwards. So there, sure, I believe there could be prophets. Now, one of the things is Moses kind of listed some criteria in Deuteronomy 18 that the prophet's going to always be right. And I haven't seen that. I, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not per se an absolute disbeliever. I'm just saying, show it to me. And if someone never got it wrong, wouldn't we know that? Wouldn't we have met that person? Um... And it wasn't on the debate stage this past week. I can't do that. But, 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 but the thing is, is, does God heal? Well, absolutely. God healed in the Old Testament. God healed in the New Testament. God will heal in the future. So does God heal? Absolutely God heals. Now, here's what I know, though, and here's where I land on this. In the New Testament church, in the founding of the New Testament church, miracles are are what landed in the places where Jesus ministered and the apostles minister to, to, to give a foothold to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And so these miracles, we don't see. It's not recorded. How many times did Peter try to perform a healing and it didn't work? Well, we, those aren't outlined. We're shown the things that give us faith, that make us realize that, yes, it absolutely can be done. Yes, it's a thing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we find the gifts of the Spirit, there are nine of them. And one of them is curiously worded, it is worded gifts, plural, of healing. 
Does God give gifts of healing? Yes, he does. I know people who've received a gift of miraculous healing. I know that. But now, if it happened every time, then we'd have people that were centuries old, but we don't. There comes a time when God's purpose for us on this earth is done and we get sick or we have a head-on collision, or, or so, but it's time for us to depart. And so this miracle, these miracles, resulted in the evangelization of the whole region, gave an opportunity to speak. Peter was a man who had an opportunity to speak to all of those people in that region about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ himself, when he healed the man of the pool of Bethesda, it was an opportunity that John took advantage of to say, here's what Jesus did and here's what Jesus can do for you. So here's the reality. I believe in miracles. I believe in, in, in everything outlined in the New and Old Testament. And I think there are certain restrictions on those things, but I'm not sure what they are. All I know is this, the way we conduct our services, the way we live our lives, is to glorify Jesus Christ and take what God gives us. The key to evangelism for us is our changed lives. That's the key to evangelism. If we want to say, well, here's why you should come fellowship with us. Here's why you should be my friend. Here's why you should become a believer changed lives. And if you honestly believe that when Jesus Christ comes into your life, you accept Christ your personal Savior, that your life literally changed, and now you're happier, pupils say that Christians are happier people. It says that Christians are healthier people. There is empirical evidence to show that Christians are more everything, actually. Not violent, but more all the good things. Because of their relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, our key to evangelism is to show people our changed lives. And this is what they need as well. Let's stand together, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.